All right, so Cody and Savannah are defendants, and then I have a bunch of parties here. I want to sort of make sure I understand who's here and maybe rename some of you. All right, Barbara, what is it that you do for KJK? I'm, I'm the manager for Village Estates. All right. And then, Michael, what do you do for KJK? I'm in the uh, accounts receivable department. All right, Mr. Cameron. Yes, I'll be primarily representing us. I'm the president of KJK. All right, and Mr. Atuma. I am a subcontractor doing maintenance. All right. <laughs> so this is file 230367SC, KJK Real Estate Management versus uh, Cody Hickman and, uh, I'm sorry, Savannah, what's your last name? Pullen. All right. This is a small claims case. What we mean by small claims is that you are here without attorneys. We're trying to handle this without the use of uh, bringing in attorneys by just having it in front of me as opposed to a jury trial in the district court judges uh, in general civil. You also cannot ask for more than $6,500. You are aware of that as a plaintiff. I know your dollar amount is higher than that, but that's the max you can re recover in small claims. You understand that? Yes, I'm aware, Your Honor. All right. The other thing is, if either party requests this to go in general civil, it would be allowed. Are you both willing to proceed here in small claims? Yes. Yes. All yes, right. Sure. Anybody, anybody who might testify today, I need you to go ahead and raise your right hands. I'm going to swear everyone in. Swear or affirm that all the information you would testify to here today would be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Swear. I swear. I do. All right. I may uh, hop around a bit here, uh, but so it's my understanding that this was a landlord tenant situation and this is no longer the case, right? You do not live there anymore. Correct. Did you have a case in landlord tenant court? No. All right. Uh, and then how long were you there? Did eight I see years. that right? It's eight years. Yeah. yeah. All right. So eight years and paying somewhere around eight hundred dollars a month. Yep, eight ninety five usually. About eight to nine hundred. They varied. I was gonna say because you know I'm assuming it was probably cheaper the first lease and. Yeah. Yeah, it goes up yeah. every year. Yep. <clears throat> All right. But still, because uh, a lot of things are going to happen here that are different than what parties think is going to happen here. So I just want to get my uh, math straight, all of us on the same page, that what we are talking about is more than $75,000 successfully changing hands between the parties, right? Correct. And yes. we're really just talking about after this relationship is over, how much money we need in damages and or unpaid rent. Yep. Sure. So I'm, I'm sure that you are familiar with that what we are talking about here is you can recover something above and beyond normal wear and tear. I'll tell you right now that the numbers that you have, there, you, there's nowhere near you're going to get close to that. A lot of that's going to get whacked down as what I would consider eight years of wear and tear. Uh, but let's start with, first things first, whether or not there's any uh, unpaid rent due. Because that's uh, different nope. than damages. Nope, we paid rent. Um, we actually dropped off the keys, and they said that we didn't drop them off until about a month. I understand that. There's some sort of bizarre language here where the plaintiff is saying, since they didn't get the keys until February 3rd, that you would somehow owe the uh, uh, money for rent. So I want to start with plaintiffs. I have this uh, a 30 day notice at the end of November. They were going to be out at the end of December. Did you actually leave before yep. January 1? Yep. All right. So are the plaintiffs saying that there is unpaid rent that's due? Your Honor, there was um, as of December 31, $58 in unpaid rent. A ledger has been provided with that detail. And then rent for January 1 through 3, 
uh, following the language of the lease, the keys were returned on January 3. So those three days for $81.77. In addition, there's unpaid uh, water and sewer bill, um, which the utility company charged to the community uh, for $190.19. Okay, and what were the dates of that use? The dates of that use that um, let me pull this up. The final, the final billing, the final meter reading was taken on twelve thirty of twenty two, so December thirty of twenty two, and the. Final amount due of $190.19 when not paid by the tenant. Um, the utility company passed that along as a balance due to the community. Okay. Is that all for utilities, the $190.19, or is there another utility involved? We're the tenant is responsible for water, excuse me, for water and sewer, which we just talked about, gas and okay. electric. We asked the tenant to provide, um, they're responsible for those on direct payment to the utility companies. We asked for them to verify that those had been paid in full. We have not received re a receipt indicating that. Um, so we would still like the tenant to produce that so that we know nothing is going to be coming back to us as a landlord. The utilities company um, sometimes operate in strange ways where we don't find out about this until months and months later if there's an unpaid balance. Okay, that that burden would not be on them to uh, essentially. You do not have an outstanding utility bill for gas or electric. No, we it's in our name, so it, we paid it off, and then it moved to our new account. Transferred so to our new house. We never left anything existing at all. So we have eighty-one dollars in unpaid rent, one hundred ninety dollars and nineteen uh, cents in unpaid utilities, and then we're ready to move on to damages unless you want to. Your Honor, there's a $58 balance at December 31, plus the 81.77 for the three days of January. What's plus this $58? How do, you, how do you pay $58 less rent than you normally pay? Sure, there was a ledger provided. I mean, it's possible, I just don't understand. Sure. Don't there you was pay the same amount every month? Um, there was a ledger provided to the court and um, it's a function of late fees that arose on what? October 6 of 2022 and a consistent short payment of $3 um, for the total amount due. There's a due eight during that time frame of this ledger, the rent was eight forty-five, a recycle fee of three dollars, a pet fee of fifty. Um, so they were paying eight ninety-five. Um, there was a late fee on seven seven of twenty twenty-two, a late fee of for thirty-five dollars, a late fee on ten six for thirty dollars, and then the short pay of the three dollars. Those things over the period of July 2022 to December 2022 left a $58 balance. Uh, may I say something or no? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so when we signed the contract, there was no $3 recyclable fee. And then halfway through living there, they decided mm -hmm. to add that, which never got added to our contract. And then every Did time we ever, would make that. Was that ever added to your month to month lease? No. Then we were told about it about four years ago, and then we made a couple payments and we quit doing it. And because they never proved that they recycled or whatnot, and then they ended up just we made four years of non making three dollar payments. I don't understand why it'd be dressed now when we if we would have missed a day payment, they would have dressed at any amount of money. So I don't understand why that's what I was going to ask them next, too. Is how do you have a late payment that's due months before they leave and you don't address it till after they left? And we've never Why had have to pay that yet? the very next month. Right. A monthly balance letter is sent out. Absolutely not. You had you had not received that? 
at no point ever, ever in the eight years that we've been there. Absolutely not. All right, let's 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 move on because there's a lot of things here. Here's what I want to ask you, sir, as the owner of this company. You use a maintenance company, right? That's Mr. Atuma? Yes, sir. How do you know Mr. Atuma? <clears throat> Doug's company has been doing business with us for several years, Your Honor. And, not uh, related. Not related by blood. That is correct. All right. I, I won't pursue that any further uh, other than to suggest to you, you are getting numbers uh, on maintenance contracts that <laughs> I would certainly balk at as an owner, but we'll move to that. All right. So now we're going to get into damages. So there was a security deposit here. It wasn't much. What was it? 750. 750 maybe yep. 700. excuse me excuse me your honor 725 dollars okay i apologize uh, i'm sorry so 700 uh 25 dollars security deposit so now what we're going to do is sort of crawl <laughs> through these uh damages that were ex 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 uh, assessed right and, and here's where i'll tell you what the problem is i looked at all your photos uh, let's take carpet, for instance. You had a tenant that didn't leave for eight leases, right? Essentially year-to-year -year leases. So uh, that is, let's call that a, a boon uh, to a landlord. That's fabulous because every time you have turnover, you have to go in there, clean the place out, replace you know whatever went wrong, get it all nice and, and ready for the next tenant. You didn't have to do that for at least so, sort of seven cycles with this tenant. You understand my logic at that point, right? Your Honor, we signed two-year leases with our tenants, so they went through three cycles. That is correct. Okay. So here's the problem. You're, you're trying to do things like saying, well, we're going to repaint the whole place or we're going to replace all the carpet in the whole place. Those are, those are not things that is, you're going to turn around and say that the tenant who lived there for eight years is going to pay for kit and caboodle. That's just not how this works. I'm assuming you're a landlord. You do this security deposit all the time. You're allowed to get them for things like holes in the wall that are this big around, like yeah. I saw. And, and I, I find that the tenants... Uh, in their written response are, are being infinitely reasonable in them agreeing with certain things that they realize have to be replaced, like when blinds are totally destroyed. You, you know, the landlord has to get the next place looking nice enough that the next tenant says, okay, I want to live here. And so there are certain things like when we're talking about a destroyed blind that I think the, the former tenants are like, okay, I don't know what happened to it. But you understand why they're saying, we're not going to fix that. They're blinds, they're, they're chewed up, bent, whatever. They're going to just get bought and replaced. But many of these big ticket items are just things that are not something you're going to charge them to replace. And essentially, they're going to provide you with $15,000 worth of uh, remodel to this unit for the next person. I find it really disingenuous that you're even asking for that after you've received $80,000 from these people as tenants who weren't giving you issues. And I sit here and do this all day. I know that KJK is not coming in here and, you know, nickeling, diming people all, all the time. I don't see that. So I'm just, mm -hmm. I don't understand why this particular uh, case, we have, you know, someone that you're saying, $1,800, I've drywalled an entire house for $1,800. And you're talking about replacing, let's, let's be real here, this was not high-end finishes. This is a real baseline abode that you are renting out. And I get it that things need to be fixed. They can't be, you know, just be destroyed. But you're, you're essentially, you know, paying to either have things entirely replaced throughout the house or what we would call, okay, things need to be addressed and fixed, paying a, a dollar amount that is, is just sort of well above what I would expect to see. 
Is there something I'm not seeing about the nature of this relationship that you had with these tenants? Or why we're here asking for $15,000 in damages? Your Honor, our claim is for 10778 And as you know, we are limited to- Well, that's to... after they actually responded. If they hadn't responded to you, you would have just gone with your original numbers, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, We're... even after even after they, uh, see, you originally tried to charge them $15,578 against their $725 security deposit. <laughs> and then they responded to you saying, for four pages saying, come on now, some of these things are reasonable, but you're asking $400 to clean a stove that's not worth $400. Your Honor, when... We've been in the uh, rental business for a long time. And of course, you also see a lot of rental cases. But uh -huh. when, I, when our initial review of this home occurred with estimates, uh, this is one of the worst damaged homes we've seen in many years. And so the appliances in the kitchen needed cleaning after we are able to respond to their concerns and after we're able to get some actual invoices for work performed, many of these adjustments were made. And so you can see how the 15,000 or the high 14,000 mark comes down quickly to the 10,778. The cleaning bill in question for excessive cleaning of the kitchen appliance was $120. That's the actual damage claim based on the invoice. The well, sure, room. but if you if you didn't have tenants that are actually concerned enough about their own uh, hide here that they're responding in writing and willing to show up at small claims, uh, if they had just not showed up, which happens plenty of times, you know, people move on and they say, fine, take my security deposit. We would have been with the numbers that you're originally here on. And, and that's why I'm saying I'm really cautioning, like, I know this isn't a common practice for you because you would be running into this same wall with me every time. I don't remember having an instance like this, but let me just move on a little. Normally, if you're talking about a lease that's up and then they left excessive uh, junk and you have to come and pay somebody to haul that off, I understand that. But essentially, uh, I, I, I'm just wondering when we're talking about, you know, that I need $600 for someone to clean out whatever it is that they left over in the home, which from the photos, I can't really tell what we're talking about. But you want $600 after they've lived there and paid you rent for eight years. Your Honor, again, you're looking at the initial. So, so if you paid someone $10 an hour. They spent 60 hours moving junk in and out of that unit after the tenants had left? Your, Your Honor, there are no $10 an hour laborers in our world. And okay, I'll give you a $20 an hour laborer. They spent is, 30 hours and there picking is this, up piles of junk and moving it out of the residency? Where would you bring the garbage, Your Honor? It has to go in a dumpster or a refuse service has to take it. And all of these things are part of the cost. <clears throat> so when oh, we... I, I agree, but I'm just saying that that I'm, I'm a little bit offended that these are the numbers that someone who wasn't willing to come to the uh, their own defense and show up here or write these papers would have gotten me have to give you a default judgment for $6,500 because that's the max on a bunch of these sort of unanswered issues. So your honor, we've asked for $120 for the excessive cleaning of the appliances to save that appliance. We asked for $200 to remove a shed full of uh, furniture and items. And we've left, including a tarp full of garbage in the yard. And we are asking for $95 to cover our costs for the leftover garbage that was in the home. And then what we, the other problem we have is essentially, and these are things that, you know, we sort of have to get back into the history of things, but uh, I'm looking under the sink, right? And the sink is put together with essentially electrical tape. 
And then you're saying that, well, there's so much water damage, we're going to just replace the kitchen cabinets and we want the tenants to pay for that. And then normally the tenants would just take the hit for that, except that they're saying, well, yeah, I mean, we remember that and we asked so-and-so to come and fix it. And, you know, we're referring to people that probably haven't worked there for years. I just mean, at, at what point in time are we saying this is what they reasonably owe versus, look, you have to rehab your unit. Uh, you, you got it, you know, you had tenants in there for eight years. You're going to have to go in and, and sort of fix things or like essentially, and I don't, uh, some of these things, you know, I'd have to go back and look at the uh, pictures, but when we're talking about light fixture covers, we're not talking about outlet plates, right? Correct. We're talking about the globes for the light fixtures on the outside of the home and throughout the home. Okay. All right. And we're talking about and, the light. And, and, and we're talking like, about the labor like, on it. Pick that up. And uh, you know, those... window screens, uh, things happen. I'm assuming I think you had some pets. You know, if a screen has holes in it, that screen has to be replaced. I think the tenants sort of understand that and, and we're we're sort of reasonable in their assessment. Well, let, let's look at it from another way because these are these numbers aren't going to be nothing. They're going to add up. I think that Savannah and Cody realized there's plenty of items that were actually just what we would call damage. You know, the, the, the landlord doesn't have to just eat that. There's going to be money. It's that we have to come to terms with where that money is. So now I kind of want to turn, you heard me sort of, you know, pushing back on some of these numbers. But now, really, I'm going to turn to you. You understand at the end of the day, there's going to be a judgment here. You're going to owe this landlord money because it's going to eat up more than your $725. Absolutely. Yeah. So we just want this to be reasonable. Build. Yeah. Um, the other thing, too, is at least we can all agree when we're talking about like the linoleum and the, and the carpet and stuff, we're talking about the a real sort of baseline finishes that were in there to begin with it wasn't like this was a good carpet but you understand that if there's destroyed carpet that's going to get replaced it's just about how often would you have to replace carpet anyway essentially um because i just i don't know how a ceiling you know cracking is something the tenants are doing that when if it needs to be replaced and it's a popcorn ceiling anyway you know, see here, here's one of the things you had a roof leak that you did report. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and your honor, that's an item that's not charged here on this claim. Well, it was to repaint, paint the roof. The, the roof repainting has to do with how filthy the roof was not to take care of the repair of the damaged okay. area. So we have never even smoked in there. We use, every time we've used the stove, we use the exhaust fan. So in, if there's any excess smoke or grudge, it would be from and not the smoke not coming out the Which correct I way. To the and, and I will tell you, one of the big expenses that's just going to cost you at the end of the day, Savannah and Cody, is you know it's not easy to repair. When we talk about holes in the wall, if you're hanging pictures with nails, they're not even going to charge for that because you spackle it. But sure. if the if you got a fist size hole in, in in the wall, spackling that is an inferior option. A big enough hole, you're just going to have to replace the drywall, and that's not cheap. That's going to end up costing you mm -hmm. uh, uh, money. And you understand that, like once your hole is bigger than a sure. reasonable, uh, we drove a nail to hang a painting, you're going to be yep. paying for that. 100%. Um, um, and, you know, let's see here. Uh, and I also did notice there was plenty of, there was doors that were, you know, if you have a door and then there's a part of the door that's actually you know, pop busted in or something like that. You don't really fix that. You replace the whole door. Sure. All right. So let's talk about some things we sort of do agree on. 
So with the blinds, there's plenty of blinds that just straight up need to be rebought and yes, absolutely <laughs> paid for. And then instead of and then you said, hey, we agree with that. We just think it's high. But they're telling you, look, those blinds are they might be 32 bucks a, a piece. But that's if you get lucky that the size that the window you're talking about is the size of the blind that's on sale at the store. And if not, you got to pay someone the labor to sit there and cut those blinds uh, and make sure that they uh, add up nice. So in other words, things like replacing blinds, it's not just $32 per uh, uh, unit. Uh, I don't really have a problem with saying that it's going to take four hours to go ahead and uh, make sure that those blinds aren't just, you know, popped in and, and, and fit nice. So even if we're talking about uh, that and then, I don't know, do you have, is, is this a general labor rate that you pay your maintenance? We're at seven times 32 for a blind here. Yeah. To... 210. 24, I'm fine with that. And then yeah. I have it, you know, it, it, and so you have about uh, $240 in labor of four hours. So you're you're getting charged $60 an hour for labor. Uh, I answer, Jack. $50, $50 per hour, Your Honor. Doug, um, $50 per hour is the charge rate there, Your Honor. All right. may, I, may I interject? Doug, Doug. Uh -huh. let's, just let's let's proceed. Okay. If you well, if, I'm not telling you you can't say something, but I mean, if we just want to move on from there. All right. So we actually have uh, door and door hanging. I'm assuming those aren't inside hollow doors from a bedroom or something. Those are actual doors to the outside, right? Hollow. No, no, those are the end doors, hollow ones. Very hollow. All right, but, but that's what I mean is we're it, it, the well, let's take this, uh, you know, break it down here. They're saying four doors need to be replaced altogether. So out of those four, how many of those are inside outside? Doors? I believe they're all inside, but we don't think it should be four. It should be about three. But I don't know what their their note said. So I don't know if they said it was outside. Or not. Um, Your Honor, there were four inside doors. All right. So those photos. are those are hollow doors. How much are you paying for them? And and by fold doors. So all right, because you have fourteen hundred dollars to replace those. No, we have nine hundred and forty dollars, Your Honor. What is a by fold door? That's a closet door. What was wrong? With the None of the door? closets had by folds. One had a slider. And the slider was still there. And working. the other two had I, I'm, the sorry. I, I'm sorry, you're right. I was referring to the slider. And the claim, the, the request is, the claim is $940, Your Honor. And the right. slider was there still but, working. But that's so. what I mean by, I understand that you, you're requesting 940, but that's not really what you're requesting. You're requesting, you were requesting $1,400. So that's what I mean by, let's take an example and see how we get there. Now, okay. a hollow core door, uh, Look, if you buy an indoor outdoor door and you got to hang it, you're going to talk about hundreds of dollars to, to buy an indoor hollow door and hang it. It's not really hung. It's uh, attached to the screwed into the frame. So essentially, even if we say that's four of them. Do you see where I'm saying that these I don't these numbers, I don't know where you get them from. Doug, could I ask you, Your Honor, may I have Doug elaborate on the cost sure. of each of these door units and the cost to finish those and the cost to hang those? Sure. So we purchased those from Capital Supply. That's the only one that really sells them to fit these units. That's in Grand Rapids. So I'm running from Holland, Michigan to Grand Rapids to pick up these doors. Then I'm driving down to Allegan. I'm, in, I'm taking the, door, the existing doors off, taking the hardware off, installing that new hardware on these new doors and mounting them and fixing trim to make it all work. Okay, and I understand that, but that's not the tenant's problem. 
that there's That's only one kind of door there that you got to go and you're he's, you're getting paid to drive back and forth from Grand Rapids. <laughs> I'm talking about what they should be paying is what we would consider to be a reasonable rate to replace an inside hollow or door. Your Honor, isn't the reasonable cost what the actual cost is? Because if you wreck no. a door, why, why would that not be the reasonable because cost? Because you could choose to put mother of pearl inlay in your kitchens and all your places. That doesn't mean that that's what they're paying to replace. What they're replacing is some of the just cheapest stuff that you have going on in a home there. Let's we're, be real here. We're not talking about a high-end condo. Your Honor, we're replacing with light kind materials. And so the cost yes. are the cost. Yes, and you yeah. know what that door costs? I'd be surprised if it costs 50 bucks. Oh, well, let's, let's, let, let's let Doug speak to that, please. Yeah, All I, right. I believe that those are um, 80. I don't have the exact number in front of me, but I think they're about $83 each. All right. And when so they you charged him $1,151 in labor to put those doors in. No, Your Honor, the total, the total invoice on the doors was $940. Okay, I, I understand why you're saying that, but I want you to quit saying it because that's only because they put up a fuss. You Your Honor, built that's... them originally and you said, we need $1,400 to replace the doors that you broke. Your Honor, may I, may I clarify something that you and I are not seeing eye to eye on? When we, yes. did our when we did our initial estimate of cost, which is the very first notice the tenant you're looking at, those are all estimated items. When we revised that notice to tenant, it's borne out primarily by actual cost and the actual experienced cost and the invoices that support it. So therefore, the 940 is bearing the actual cost. This isn't a fishing expedition on our part to just throw a big number out there. Although I will admit on our first go around, the estimate is to make sure we are covered. But we routinely- Here's the problem. Here's your, the problem routinely... with your explanation and it's why you're losing ground with me. Okay. You sent, here's the way this works. When someone moves out, if you want to claim anything against, they have to give you an address, right? That's the first part. If they don't do that, they're screwed. The second thing is you have to mail them an itemized list of the damages you want. That's exactly what you did. Yes, sir. Then they responded to that saying, hey, half this stuff is BS. And then you responded to them. On February 10th of this year, we received your updated correspondence, which was in response to our notice to tenant. Uh, and then here's all the things you disagreed with. You went through them line by line, one through 18, and said half the time, oh, okay, well, here's the new revised number. So the thing you're telling me about estimate and actual is BS, because your first sheet where it says $1,400 says estimate. Your next sheet where it's down to 940 still says estimate. Yes, sir. But, but at that time, right. we, but yes. So but let's talk time. about what you tried to do to these tenants. What you tried to do to these tenants is charge them, I don't even know what, hundreds of percentage of markup on the damage to replacing this unit. I find that to be either you're being taken advantage of by the people that are invoicing you, or you're here to try to take advantage of the tenants. Your Honor, if that's I'll let you tell me which one of those two you think it is, Your but Honor, I'm disturbed by this. Well, Your Honor, I apologize for that appearance. I don't believe it's either of those items. All right. So we, and if I could back up, and I'm more than willing to go through each of these items, but we went through and on a timely basis made an estimate and sent this to the tenant. And then I believe had a good faith exchange with them to hear um, what they thought. And we were starting to get true costs so we could incorporate in those. Um, we did not receive a forwarding address from this tenant. You'll notice that these mailings were going initially to their um, Village East number seven residents you'll notice that their move out notice did not give us a forwarding address. And you'll notice that 
um, only when we received their initial mailing to us, replying to our first notice to tenant, did were we able to ascertain what their new address was? Well, sure, but were they having mail forwarded? How did I they can't. get your correspondence to the original address? They can do that sure. as long as they're able to get the correspondence. By uh, all right, but that's neither here nor there. It, it, essentially, here's the problem: they owe you money. All right. It's it's clear that they owe you money. Like I said, Savannah and, uh, Savannah and Cody, this damage is going to be more than seven twenty five. All right. My problem is I certainly am not going to go with the numbers provided to me from the landlord. And I have a problem with the numbers provided by the landlord so much so that it's that I have to decide what I think is fair here and what I think is fair is looking a lot like giving you less money than I probably even would have given you if we had just come in and said what these damages are, what they have to pay for. Because if they hadn't come in and put up a fuss, they'd be they'd have a judgment against their credit now for $6,500. Uh, I mean, so part of this is me sort of going through the motions here that if, if you, we want to come in here periodically into court and, and, and go through this and ha have me continue to sort of talk to you in a way that I, I'm sure you don't appreciate, that's your option. We can do that on every case. But essentially, I just want you to get sort of a better sense of what I consider to be reasonable in these cases. Here's the other thing, just so we're all on the same page. Savannah and Cody... The number at the end of the day here of how much I would award in damages would be a lot higher if this was after one lease, right? Because sure. after one lease, if we're looking at all the damages that we're right. talking here, that's you guys live in La Vida Loca in this, right. in this house, all right? Now, realistically, when we start to spread that over animals and two people live in life and whatever Maybe else, eight, you know. Eight-year-old. Child as well. And a, and a child. You know, we start to spread that over those several leases there. It looks more and more reasonable, all right? But you still know at the end of the day you're going to get hit with uh, damages Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Uh, but the other side of it is when you have a relationship this long where you're essentially both satisfied, you have a place to live and you call that home for eight years and the landlord's getting the, the rent that you agreed upon for or, or by and large for you know seven years and 11 months, that, that at the end of the day is a good relationship. Everybody sort of got what they wanted out of it. The problem is there's a certain cost here now for the landlord to get this ready for it to be the home for the next people and He's spending more money than he should because some of this is actual straight up damages, things that went wrong, things that he shouldn't necessarily be on the hook to pay for because they're above and beyond normal wear and tear. And yep. we sort of would have got into that with things like cleaning, moving junk out, carpets, and painting, right? Because all of those things, had they been drastic in, in, in a shorter term, would have looked more to me like not reasonable wear and tear. So I want the landlord to, uh, to sort of understand here. It's not like I'm saying you can't charge someone to get the place uh, cleaned up, to get the paste, uh, you know, looking nice with a fresh coat of paint or uh, put the carpet in. It's just that if you look at this the way I look at this, that you didn't have to do any of those things for several leases now, that that starts to build up a, a bank of, of, of essentially credit with you that you're saving money because you're not churning and burning with your tenants. And so by the time they do leave and you're looking at carpet that probably should just be torn up and replaced or, you know what, it's not like we need to paint the bedroom. We should probably just give the whole place a coat of paint. We're going to have to have someone go in there and give it a deep clean. All of those things look start to look to me more and more like uh, that's just sort of a wash that, you know what I mean? That's the sort of thing that you would have had to done time after time, but you didn't have to do that with them. So the fact that it's a little more drastic, paint the whole place instead of paint some areas, replace the whole carpet instead of get the carpet, you know, clean, spot cleaned or something like that. It looks a lot more like a wash. The things that we're talking about, they're definitely just going to cost you money is 
you know, replacing doors, replacing light fixtures, replacing holes in the wall, placing blinds, all that stuff you're actually going to be paying money for. And so the reality is, at some point in time, what I have to do here is make a decision. And it's going to be a decision that uh, parties are not going to be happy with because essentially the landlord would always like that number to be higher. The tenants would always like it to be less. I just have to come in and go, boom, this is what I'm doing. So here's the way I want to explain it to you. Two things. First of all, damages is what I think that you owe. Uh, and then costs, the landlords, they paid certain money out of pocket to get us here. They had to pay a filing fee to court and they had to pay you, have you served. $125.94. That is neither here nor there with all of the stuff we've been talking about. Just so you know, that's always sort of on top of a judgment. So essentially, what I'm going to do is, and, and then what I want to explain to everybody is that both parties have a right after this decision to say, I don't agree with what just happened in there. I want this to go to general civil. General civil in front of the district court is different. It's a lot more formal. It goes by what we call the rules of evidence. Generally, you would uh, engage attorneys. So either party has a right to contest my finding here today, but I do think you probably need to weigh uh, how much either more money you think you could get or how much less money you think you could get uh, from this judgment once you start involving attorneys. But what I'm going to make a damages finding for is in the amount of $3,225. Of that, $725 is a security deposit that will not be coming back to the tenants. So what we have is an actual new damages award of $2,500. I consider that to be for things that literally need to be replaced because they're broken and that that should come out of the tenant's <laughs> pocket. A lot of the things that I would, like I was referring to, that are things that, uh, like carpet, paint, cleaning, moving out items, uh, I consider that to be a wash with just the sheer length of tenancy that we had here and the fact that I think about $80,000 $80, or so has changed hands over the years. But, so the damages award is in the amount of $2,500. Like I said, there's $125.94 in costs. That will be the uh, judgment that is sent out to parties. You do not have to wait for that judgment. If either party is thinking, nope, that's no good. I, I don't agree with that. I wish to contest this. Your right on appeal is this. You must ask for that appeal within seven days of today's date, and you must ask for that appeal in writing. Otherwise, the window of opportunity closes. All right. So essentially, if you accept this finding, the parties need to be in touch with each other to determine uh, how that money goes back and forth. And if either party is not accepting of this finding, you do have a timetable to appeal it further. Both parties understand their rights on appeal. Yes. Yes, Your Honor. OK, then I'm going to go ahead and release parties. Thank you for coming in uh, by Zoom. Thank you so much. Thank you for what we needed to do here.